I think maybe we can also start with this one because uh, we can also see that, but this is in, actually in your presenter mode. Okay, um, yep. yeah, I think you. it's, uh, apologize for this uh, technical issues. So um, I think uh, let, let, let's start. Um, well, today I would like to share with you um, on a couple of things, you know, the. Uh, Basically, my uh, presentation actually is uh, split into two parts. You know, one is the uh, what I call the, um, uh, the the China piece, and then the other one is really Hong Kong. But because uh, most of the people, um, most of the people actually um, uh, know more about Hong Kong than China, that's why I will spend a little bit more time on China than the uh, other one. So, um, without further ado, I just dive right in, and I guess uh, the the first part is about China and. Um, on the uh, API first, uh, you know, strategy and also the financial service sector in chi uh, uh, in China, and as you can probably see, you know, the um, the first one, you know, the um, on China, the the regulatory body is pretty, uh, you know, is uh, has been reformed for the last uh, couple of years, and and I think the first part is the uh, the SDC, the Financial Stability and Development Committee, which is the key piece, you know, within the financial body, you know, they try to create a super. Uh, financial uh, uh, supervisory body in China, and that's why uh, this becomes a even the the parent of the uh, PBOC, which dictates the uh, the monetary policy, uh, etc. In China, and uh, the most important two regulatory bodies in in China would be the CBIRC, which oversee the insurance and banking sector, whereas the uh, the CSRC is uh, oversee the uh, the securities market. Uh, and, and obviously those two, you know, a lot of them actually um, have um, a lot of commonality, especially when you talk about the, uh, the financial economy and also when the, uh, especially when you play, a, uh, when, when the technology play in place, you can see the convergence, you know, graduate in China because at the moment everything is segregated, you know, from banks cannot do securities and then uh, also futures companies entirely separate. And uh, and then trust company is again is not a bank, so it is a bit complicated. But uh, that's how they regulate it, and that's how they uh, minimize the risk, the market risk as well. And that's why the uh, first you need to understand this whole regulatory framework, you know, before you know when when you start entering China and 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 ultimately understand how you know how dynamic works, you know, within um, within industry. So the next one is really the, uh, in terms of licenses, and uh, uh, you know, already mentioned, you know, because of the complexity, there's all these different licenses. On the left hand side, these are the traditional uh, financial licenses, you know, in China today, and um, and then on the right hand side, these are the exciting bit because you know uh, the online financial entities has been uh, formed for the last um, last twelve to fifteen years, and probably the first one is actually the um, the third-party payment, which is Alipay, WeChat Pay, etc. That happens already more than a decade ago. And that was the uh, set the wave of the tr uh, transformation in the entire financial industry, it started from payment. And um, and then a couple of years later, in about 2012, there comes the consumer finance uh, uh, and microcredit uh, companies that is starting to um, not just enter the market, but actually making the um, uh, you know, so-called the service offerings to the unbanked population, and then, for, and then in the more uh, recent days, in this uh, 2014, uh, that's a landmark for, uh, I guess, the most major milestone for the financial industry in China, which is the digital bank. Um, the first digital bank was actually set, um, uh, set um, actually uh, set by um, my bank, which is part of Tencent Group, and the internet banks is actually a brand new license. You know, that was uh, you know issued by China Chinese government. And then uh, before that, uh, very interesting, uh, the direct banks that you also require, uh, the banks are also require a license to operate as a direct bank. Well, the difference between a digital bank and a direct bank is that the a direct bank is actually like a, uh, a department of a Chinese bank and they just launch online services, right? And this is uh, often regarded as the first stage before you become a digital bank. And that's why the uh, most of the many big banks in China today already have the direct bank licenses. They utilize those, uh, uh, have that uh, departments to actually drive a lot of the technology innovations and the digital transformation as well. And then now came the internet banks, which is the the latest stage, which is the um, like I said, uh, my bank and then WeBank, etc. 
And a lot of things are happening also uh, at the same time, the internet insurance actually, uh, I think this year, uh, some have been issued the license as well. And that's why if you look at all this landscape, it's actually pretty exciting. And uh, all of things are going online. All of them are brand new. And uh, some of them are actually set up by uh, technology companies. Some of them are by banks. And uh, and then eventually, I think, you know, it will be foreign places as well, because uh, as we speak, um, UBS actually already state that they have an uh, absolute desire to open up a uh, apply the license of a digital bank this year. And I haven't heard anything yet, but uh, the UBS already made that announcement and uh, sort of acknowledged by the uh, by the Chinese government as well. So they actually want to launch a, a digital bank in China and to launch their wealth business. And uh, and then eventually they want to use the same technology, they will create a brand new technology in China, and then eventually they want to lift out and then ship it overseas to service other locations as well so that is going to be uh, uh, something uh, to you know to uh, keep an eye on and then uh, this is actually a uh, uh, very interesting slide as well because uh, on the left hand side you see the income and banks are just a, a subset of it obviously it's got like uh, 4,000 banks in China today and on the left hand side you got income and banks and then you also have the so-called spin-offs and the spin-offs is actually uh, is actually by the banks um, that means ICBC have their fintech spin-off and CIB, you know, have the spin-off, and probably the most well-known in Hong Kong probably is the One Connect. It's actually by Ping Ping Group. They actually had a spin-off, you know, a few years back already, and uh, and that's why the uh, what's interesting is that this spin-off is actually is a is a entirely separate entity, and um, and uh, uh, as you know, some of the banks are actually have an entirely different set of payroll. The structure is different. And that's how you make innovation work because, you know, otherwise, you know, the internet, you know, the guys from the internet industry will not, don't want to join the banking industry, a legacy industry, and uh, with no innovations and no lack of innovation. So that's why the fintechs, it's about 12 of them today in China. And all of these are actually uh, not just trying to serve the, the mothership, but they also want to break into the third party market as well. They want to do a lot of other cool stuff than some of them actually bought the payment operators as well in, in China. And in the middle part, obviously, is the um, all of us, uh, you know, the, the fintech, uh, uh, different fintechs in China. And today, there are about 65, you know, so-called uh, fintech conglomerate in China. And uh, those are, you know, not just the, the usual names, you know, usual suspect, you know, like WeChat and, uh, you know, the Tencent group, etc. But a lot of them are actually property developers. And GD is also entering the financial uh, service group, you know, car automobile company. And uh, so a lot of them actually buying different, uh, applying different licenses or making acquisition to, and you can imagine, you know, if a lot of them are becoming like end financial group, that's going to be a pretty, you know, massive market. And it, what's interesting is that every one of them try to create their own financial ecosystem and they want to get their foot into the door and they, they try to make an influence. And of course, you know, they want to uh, create, you know, addi you know uh, additional revenue for their own uh, group as well. And then on the right hand side, this is uh, what I mentioned just now, the internet banks. And um, so this is actually some banks that, you know, um, uh, WeBank, uh, MyBank, et cetera. And then below are the fintechs. And uh, I think a lot of the fintechs, you know, in, in China is, uh, has, you know, has been on the rise. And for example, 2019, I think, you know, according to the Ministry of uh, uh, Commerce, you know, about a quarter of a million uh, company actually registered as an AI company. Then obviously, you know, not all of them are really, really AI. You know technology company but but i think it just uh, tells you the the speed of the the evolution in china and a lot of the startup is actually entering market a lot of them actually i've seen uh, you know actually met it actually global players actually coming in or actually uh, or chinese returnees you know coming set up companies and as well some professors you know from the well-known university in the west you know actually coming here part of some uh, uh, local players and then create the companies and and from block for ABCD, right? You know, uh, from uh, artificial intelligence to blockchain to cloud, big data, etc. And what's uh, one, one more point I want to make is that what's interesting in the China financial ecosystem is that we will not talk about just software. We also talk about hardware. Insure, Huawei, those are the giants in China. They make they have they sell databases, middleware, and a lot of people don't know Huawei. They have the entire ecosystem in the hardware chain. You know, they are basically the you know the um, the equivalent of IBM, Microsoft, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Amazon, you know, uh, Oracle combined, you know, and uh, they have also any product that you can imagine. 
and then the solution provider like Hudson, you know, those are the sp uh, special, you know, sort of, uh, market providers, and the information provider, the equivalent of Bloomberg, you know, like, like Wind and I find uh, in China. So this is actually a very complete, you know, financial ecosystem in China today. And uh, one one more thing I uh, forgot to mention is that the, uh, what what uh, is um, um, is actually um, uh, making a wake up call for a lot of the global, uh, the incumbent banks is that we bank for example was set up in 2014 within three years time they make profits and by 2019 they actually uh has reached uh, 21 billion uh dollars us dollar of revenue and then with half a, a billion uh us uh us dollar of net income and if you just look at that i mean it's uh, even st uh, as i understand from the european uh new banks or challenger bank are not even in the in the black yet and uh and that's why this is something that is uh, quite interesting to see in China on whether it's sustainable in, in future. Uh, next is actually the PB, um, the regulation. I think it's, it's something that it's uh, unfortunate, you know, it's, um, it's not coming as far as we liked. And, uh, and only recently, uh, early this year, the uh, PBOC have released the commercial bank API security uh, management guideline. This is regarded as the probably the first step of the uh, launching the API regulation full force in China. And in parallel, there's a document called the Development of China Open Banking Report 2019. You can actually look it up in the in the internet, and uh, prepared by the uh, consortium, the National Internet Finance Association of China, along with the ENY, that provides the insight of the uh, or the viewpoint of the China industry standard. That's a very comprehensive report about that and giving advice. You know how China should evolve and then in terms of API standard. And at the same time, there are a lot of banks, are, as I know, CIP, CIP, I know people working there already in talk with PBOC. They have a consortium to work together to drive a standard. In China, it's actually a bottom-up approach where a more liberal approach was taken and uh, better for worse at, at, the, at least at this point. But at the same time, a lot of the collect uh, collective information has been gathered. And, uh, and um, as we heard, it's actually within this year or maybe postponed by the uh, COVID-19. But I think soon, you know, soon there will be a regulation that is, uh, will be serviced. And along with the data, well, the data security law already come out as a consultation paper uh, this year. And then the data privacy law will come up soon as well. And all of them will be, will be similar to the GDPR you know, in Europe. And that's why all of this will coincide and then ultimately come up with a lot of the new regulation in China to drive the, um, uh, the market forward. So uh, this is quickly uh, one of the case, you know, the CIB, what I like about CIB is that, you know, they already into banking as a service, you know, even close to seven, nine years ago without, you know, even before people talk about open API, they already launched a service and service about 300 small, medium sized bank in China and uh, using banking as a service. So they could be hosted as a server, you know, core banking system, uh, you know, subscribed by the, some of the uh, um, agricultural bank, you know, in this small uh, rural bank in China which lack the technology people, et cetera. So they already started this journey, you know, um, less than 10 years ago. And now this slide actually tells you they're taking the next step forward. About two years ago, they launched this, what they call the uh, credit lending cloud. This is actually based on a CIB FinTech arm that created this uh, system along with the FinTech partners, because obviously even CIB themselves may don't have all the complete so-called sets of uh, technology solution and the people skill as well. So they uh, come, come up with the, you know, um, you know, with the partnership with the FinTech players and then join it, they launch a service, you know, for the uh, small banks, you know, small banks in China. So uh, to, today, I think there are about like, three or four banks already signed up for that. And so what it means is that they actually uh, pro push the service out to, uh, it's like a, more like a private labels service and the lenders can actually leverage all the underwriting uh, technology and the client acquisition technology, etc. You know, through this cloud, and then uh, also uh, some other external partners will be on the le far left hand side. Such as the co lending banks can actually join you with the lenders to uh, lend this money out to the borrowers. And uh, so I think that this is some uh, kind of model that you know uh, you know CIB came up and I, uh, you know it may or may may not become the uh, the model for other banks to um, to to follow. And the next one is the construction bank of China and other bank, mega banks in China. So this is something that, you know, uh, a similar approach as uh, CIB, um, except that, you know, they have um, far more partnership, uh, you know, that they export the service to. Even though the CCP cloud, you know, have the core bank system, you know, the so-called the uh, lending services, et cetera, 
they also have connected. If you know, you know, in China, you know, if you open the app, you know, in China, most of the uh, China banking app, you 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 don't just uh, have the banking services. You have a lot of lifestyle services as well. You can book, you know, you can actually book a movie ticket and uh, through the app, and uh, also you can uh, pay your phone bills, you know, at a click of a button, and everything is seamless. And um, and this is actually packaged and then for you know bundled and then. Uh, provided to some of the platform players. It could be, uh, you know, could be um, uh, Pingdodo or other players, you know, uh, that they want, you know, that they want the banking service to tie with their back end. So, um, so that's, that's why the, 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 the partnership is actually, um, is actually delivering and uh, for the CCP cloud uh, service. And, uh, and also the last bit is the, uh, the local government in terms of public service. And, uh, and all this is, is quite uh, interesting because it's, uh, uh, it, because of the API services, it you know cut down the uh, so-called the uh, authentication uh, you know to you know ten times, for example, uh, because uh, you know you need to authenticate ID, etc. So I, I guess you know on on the China piece, I think that the challenge is that uh, is the unregulated market, and uh, so you know the unregulated mar market is actually uh, all depends on the industry at the moment, and which is being also criticized by some of the. Uh, consultants about, you know, okay, it's not really standardized, you know, and it's all driven by the big players like Tencent and Ali. But eventually, I, I strongly believe that it will change because it's uh, there's no way that it's sustainable. You know, you have the, all these different players forming different standards. It's not going to work. And and that's why that is uh, a big challenge for China to, um, to, to actually for the regulator as well to come up with that. And the other part is that the competitive environment is that uh, there's so many ecosystems already exist. You know, formed by the uh, N Financial, by the uh, Tencent, by the uh, uh, Jingdong, you know, JD, and so many of them already exist. So, how do you actually, even as a player, how do you actually uh, further connect to that, and how can you provide even better service? Because a lot of them actually, if you look, even look, going back to the banking app, you know, a lot of them look similar. So, uh, what's the differentiator for that? You know, what better service can you provide? What better products can, can you provide? I think this is uh, probably like the um, fintech. 2.0 that China need to go through to break that into, you know, um, uh, break into the market. And um, and then the last bit is that uh, the incumbent banks are moving fast. And uh, even though, I, even I thought the incumbent banks is extremely slow technology, less technology savvy, but it's actually far more than I can imagine. Especially if you think about, you know, like ICBC a couple of years ago, they did a major digital transformation. And part of it is to replace, um, Oracle, as you probably heard, the DIOE initiative in China, you know, they want to get rid of the Oracle, IBM, and EMC because of the cost, right? They want to save costs, but a lot of the banks don't want to do that because it's, it's you know, obviously we want to get rid of the IBM mainframe, right? It's so reliable, right, for decades. And, but ICBC actually bite the bullet and actually replace everything with Huawei. And so a lot of the bank, not everything, but a lot of the major uh, system actually run at the bank, the infrastructure is actually run by Huawei now. And, and that's part of the major transformation. And then in, the, in the same time, they want to provide better service to the clients. And, and that's why the, the FinTech company, the spin-off have been created by all this um, different uh, big banks in China today. And um, so I think, you know, these are the challenges, you know, for, uh, for the, you know, for the, for the China financial market. And it is not something that would be uh, over, you know, I think uh, um, overlooked and especially uh, in years to come, you know, it's uh, uh, even though they are very tech savvy and so on, but the in reality, there's still a lot of challenges ahead of them. Now, um, if I go to the now to Hong Kong, I think you know, most of the people probably in this audience, you know, all, all, all the audience, you know, understand about the financial regular structure in Hong Kong, the S SFC, obviously the securities market, and then the Hong Kong MA, the banking and the insurance authority, obviously the, um, the insurance market. And next is uh, the uh, the license, and again, it's relatively simple because it's a very mature market in in, in Hong Kong. The, the banking and, uh, for example, three tier banking system. I mean, these are the only three licenses that you can get in Hong Kong under Hong Kong MA. And securities, you get up to ten uh, different sort of licenses that you can uh, obtain, you know, from the SFC. Now the exciting bit is the virtual bank, and I think it's a long waited, you know, um, uh, sort of license, you know, for Hong Kong which I think, you know, everyone is excited about. 
And uh, even though there's some delay, especially over through the, the COVID-19, I think this is something that, you know, I, I think is, is really going to make some major change, you know, in China, you know, in Hong Kong, you know, um, in time to come. And um, no, needless to, I'm not going to go through all the details, but I think, you know, most people understand what the project banks, you know, entail. And um, this slide actually is a very business slide, but I think this is uh, interesting because if you um, compare to China, you know, uh, Hong Kong is a far more uh, cosmopolitan city and also a global city. And here you can see basically, you know, all the players are actually consists of global players and local, some of the Hong Kong players, and then also the emerging Chinese players, you know, entering the Hong Kong market as well. And this, again, I think from this perspective, is actually pretty exciting as well. And I think the, uh, all of this is actually uh, is going to pave the way for Hong Kong in years to come. And of course, the eight, um, you know, sort of licensed, you know, virtual bank already in play and eight, six of them already in, in service. You know, they already launched a, uh, launched a service already. And as a matter of fact, a couple of days ago, I just, you know, um, registered, you know, uh, two of them, you know, you know, just to try the experience. So I think, you know, this is quite, definitely exciting for Hong Kong. And the next one is, uh, Rick, I'm not going to go through this, but uh, I think most people who are in this market already know very well what, which stage we're in. And of course, you know, and I think uh, Hong Kong is actually is a top down approach where they, you know, actually it's regulated and then they want to push it to the market. But I think for a good reason, because it's been long criticized, you know, by the market and by a lot of the outsiders about, you know, the lack of innovation in the Chinese financial ecosystem and also the banks, especially. And because it's dominated by big banks and the local banks are too small to make any changes and the big banks are, you know, probably they, uh, they already obtain market share. So there's no reason for them to innovate. And uh, so this is actually going to uh, change, you know, Hong Kong. And here, um, again, I'm not going to mention it. I think it's just a summary of all the eight banks where they are right now, or what sort of services they, they, they have. And, um, and I think, um, uh, all, all of this is interesting because it's a, a mixture of uh, the shareholder, especially if you look at the structure, mo you know, a lot of them are global and local and Hong Kong as well. So I think this is something that, you know, is unlike China, which is most, mostly Chinese, but here is pretty exciting because that means, you know, there are a lot of foreign players who, who can come to play in this uh, market. And, um, and then the, um, the, uh, probably this is the last slide I have. It's, you know, uh, from the talk today and, uh, in here, these are some of the global, uh, global players because, because Project Bank is too new to, to see. I, you know, you can't really say, you know, what, you know, even though they, they you know, they, they have their plan, but it's not very concrete. But, uh, but uh, the other big banks, you know, actually have been in the open API space, you know, they've been pretty active. You know, Citibank, for example, they're probably the far most active and they already have these services that can import to Hong Kong, you know, a couple of years back already. And then DBS, again, you know, we're the leading digital bank in the region. And then, Standard Charter and HSBC even launched the, uh, I think it was a corporate, was it a uh, corporate business uh, unit where they can, uh, I forgot the, yeah, the launch open API, the first open API for business account opening with Nova, you know, made this year. So all of this is actually quite exciting. But I think um, the, the difference between the Hong Kong and Ch uh, China for these uh, challenges is, uh, the upcoming challenges, uh, I think in Hong Kong it's a relatively smaller market and, uh, and it's a crowded market. Uh, crowded by all these big banks and small banks already, a couple hundred banks already. So how does the, we, you know, the venture bank go to differentiate themselves, right? That's one, one, one question. And the other one is that the, um, the ecosystem, uh, again, you know, going back by early statement where um, it's widely crit uh, criticized about the, you know, the lack of innovation, you know, uh, why do we still use octopus card and how come we can not use a f smartphone to swipe and go in, you know, well, actually it does happen now already, but you know, the, the point is that it's not, innovative, you know, enough, you know, as a, a modern city and even China in a lot of ways are actually leading. So that's why, you know, there's a lot of room for improvement, but the API economy itself, how to actually um, break, break the ice and actually enter the market. And like I said earlier, the lifestyle, how to in integrate the lifestyle economy into the, uh, the API or through API to integrate the banking services and then have that you know, uh, so-called enclosed together to provide this brand new service to, to the customers. And I think this is a challenge for China, uh, for, for Hong Kong. And the last part is that, uh, which uh, is interesting, which uh, yesterday I you know, had a conversation with a friend of mine from Hong Kong and just saying that the, the Hong Kong retailer or the customer is actually quite conservative. And and that resonated with uh, one of us, I think it was um, at the EMY survey that uh, was um, 
uh, created uh, 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 this year, or last year, that the um, in terms of the cus uh, consumer trust, um, there's a four quadrant, you know, the high consumer trust and high standard all the way to the low consumer trust to hold low uh, uh, low standard. And Hong Kong fits in the, uh, the, the you know, the, the second quadrant, which is the low consumer trust and uh, I'll say low, um, uh, sorry, low, uh, low uh, standards. And, but it's actually emerging. It's actually, uh, you know, Singapore and Hong Kong actually uh, are doing pretty well in self standardization because they launches uh, this standard already. And then China, on the other hand, is actually low, um, um, low standard, but actually high consumer trust. So that means that they, people want to try new things. And uh, I know all the people around me in China today, they all, you know, I don't see anyone who use cash anymore, right? So no one carrying the bills outside. So, so I think, how do you break this in Hong Kong? And you know, how, how do you change this customer behavior in Hong Kong? Even though if you provide the API economy and even you have all these brand new services from uh, Virtual Bank, et cetera, if people don't even want to share the data, for example, and they're scared. And uh, so this is something that, you know, I, I think the market needs to uh, convert the mindset, you know, the consumer mindset. And that I, I perceive, you know, it would probably one of the major challenges in Hong Kong. And um, I guess, you know, this concludes my presentation. But uh, regardless of, you know, Hong Kong or China, I think, you know, definitely I think we're in, a, in an extremely exciting time, you know, and what I would like to see is actually the, the convergence between Hong Kong and China and how do they actually cross the border, of course, even forget about the remedy, you know, uh, um, you know, open up the, uh, the market economy in Hong Kong, uh, in China, etc. But the technology flow between the two sides, you know, a lot of the lessons learned from technology company in, in, in China can actually export some of them or share the lessons learned in, to Hong Kong. And also Hong Kong has a lot of cool companies, tech companies that are pretty advanced and then they can also share experience in China or enter China. So I think this um, will be very interesting to see how it's going to emerge, you know, in the years to come. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Um, um, yeah, let, let me try to Okay, so uh, I, I can see in the in the in the in the stage there's quite many uh, questions, but um, we don't have time to answer that. But uh, I, I can you share your your personal contact in the chat room? I can see that some of the people want to get your slide and maybe they want to have some further question sure. to ask you. Uh, I think sorry sorry for the technical uh, issue, but uh, I think this is a really good section that everyone is looking for. So thanks for, for thanks for your time, Greg. So yeah. Okay.